Hello and welcome everyone to this webinar with experts on outdoor learning. This event is part of the Scientix STEM Out of the Box, a STEM approach to non-STEM subjects. My name is Miriam and together with my colleagues Yelena and Diego, we would like to thank you for joining us. Before I pass the floor to our speakers, I would like to cover a few housekeeping topics. Please uh, first uh, make sure that your sound is turned on and we would like to remind you that during this webinar your cameras and microphones are off. Secondly, the webinar will be recorded and we will publish it in the course so you can watch it again if you wish. And you will also have access to the slides and the links that we will be sharing during the webinar. So today we will hear from our speakers Mary Jackson and uh, Richard Dawson. Mary is the Head of Education and Communities at uh, Learning Through Landscapes, the UK's School Grounds Outdoor Learning and Play Charity. She has a background in both education and landscape architects and has worked in the school ground sector for more than 25 years. And Richard has developed over 20 years a reputation for bringing fresh insights to education and learning. His focus is on helping organizations to improve the quality of their learning, create learning for a sustainable future, and enhance their capacity to deliver projects effectively with lasting effects, benefits. And uh, if you have any questions, you are invited to write them here in the chat, and then we will be addressing them in, uh, at the end during the Q&A session. And now, without further ado, I would like to pass the floor first to Mary. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, hopefully everything is up and running and I can make things work. But uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to this. And it's great to see uh, lots of people here. So I think my job really today is to kind of just get you thinking in a different way and inspiring you and, and seeing different ways of, of taking uh, science outside through other other routes. So um, first of all, it's just thinking about maybe this is what we think of if we think about outdoor learning and we think about science in particular where maybe we focus straight away and think it's all about the wildlife it's about biodiversity well it is but it's about a lot of other things as well so let's what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by looking at how we take STEM outside outside of lessons so in different ways um, we might look at that um, then other ways of taking STEM, but with different curriculum areas. And then I am going to touch a little bit on STEM through STEM, but I guess STEM through outdoor learning. That's my my focus. And then a little bit, hopefully at the end, on how some of the practicalities. So you, how you actually do that, because it's all very well. Hopefully by that time you're inspired and you want to take uh, some of your learning outside. But how do you actually do that and make it happen? And, and there are some kind of tricks of the trade, I guess, uh, that we'll just touch upon at the end. So. Uh, if we start out kind of STEM outside of lessons, and I suppose the thing I'm thinking of first here is, is really the importance of play and getting children and young people engaged with these topics, engaged with nature, engaged with things like climate change, engaged with lots of different things, just through play, through being outside, being in the environment and enjoying themselves. And if we look at this image straight away, we can think, what science, what engineering, what maths might be in there. And, and straight away, we probably think, oh, look, we've got nature all around us. There's lots there. But there's also engineering. How is that structure put together? How do I balance my way across? What are the things I need to think about of doing that? How do I problem solve to get from one end to the other? And they are all scientific um, skills and, and knowledge that just it's kind of done without thinking, I suppose. And that is a great way to get children, and young people interested. So. Maybe we start very young. We start at early years. And here we've got um, a child. This is in a, in a kindergarten, outdoor kindergarten in Denmark. And there's just left a whole load of resources, loose parts around the ground. So straight away, without any adult help or supervision, really. Well, ad adults around, so they know that they're, they're safe. But this is entirely kind of child led. They've got this plank and they're leaning up against another a couple of logs and and making sure it works and then climbing up it so it's really sturdy so again there we're talking about the first stages of engineering the first stages of problem solving this is all about again those things that we're talking about in those first images it's all about balance it's all about positioning it's all about thinking about how do i make this work 
Um, and this is all part of scientific thinking. So even from the very early years, we're starting to think in a scientific way. Here's another child. This is in, in Japan. Now, if you look closely at this, you'll see there is a tap in that. It's a, it's a place for washing hands. And she obviously wanted to get the water from the tap into the wheelbarrow. So what did she do? She, she thought, how on earth am I going to do that? How do I make that water move that travel that way? And found a pipe, put it over the, the tap. And now the water is nearly at the, at the wheelbarrow and she just needs to push it a bit further. Again, it's problem solving. It's thinking out, what do I need to do to make this work? And it's, again, those early stages of, of engineering and, and thinking about in, in a scientific way. Another area that a lot of schools do, they do a lot of kind of food growing, maybe outside curriculum time. And there is so much science, so much maths in this. How do plants grow? Why do some plants grow in, in our country, home nation where they might not in others? How, what do plants need to grow? Do they need soil, they need nutrients, they need light, they need water. All can be done through scientific experimentation. Why are some crops growing better than others this year than they did last year? But all the say the maths, we can estimate the crop yields. We can look at rates of growth. We can measure um, how fast those crops are going. So loads of maths in, in there as well. And this is um, something else that a lot of schools do outside of, of lesson times, kind of the bushcraft skills. But thinking about um, that fire triangle, heat, fuel, oxidising agent, usually oxygen in this case. But that you can see is quite a young child. That's not, you know, that's not a teenager doing that, but really enjoying learning about how do we get a fire going in a safe way. And that can be done really effectively. You'll see it's a very small container. That's part of a, a gilly kettle and it's really small. So the fire doesn't get too large either, but it's the excitement and the perseverance as well that's required into getting that spark and lighting that bit of cotton wool and, and getting a fire going. And again, it's all about engaging young people in scientific things when they don't know that the science is there, I suppose. But we can also look at STEM subjects across different areas of the curriculum too. It's not just, shouldn't just be restricted uh, to science lessons, which is what we're really talking about here. So what about the kind of resources that we might look at in English. So these are lots of there are loads of different books that, for example, here we've got lots of different books about trees. So some are written for very young children. Some are quite technical. Um, the Collins Complete Guide to British Trees. There's an awful lot of quite scientific technical information in there. You can imagine the trees book is the kind of basics and how to identify a tree. But there's also a poetry book there. So it's looking at trees, maybe in their scientific manner, but also in all the other things they give us, how they change through the seasons, the touch of the bark, all those things that we can develop language through and then writing for different audiences. So if we were creating um, information about a certain tree in our school grounds and it was for somebody who was early years, how would we write that? And how would we write it if it was somebody who was trying to identify the tree? Or how might we write it if we're looking at the science behind the tree? So thinking about different types of language for different audiences. I love this one. Could a full size dinosaur fit into your school grounds? It could be, could a pyramid fit into your school grounds? Pyramids are huge and there aren't many school grounds that maybe they can fit into. But there's a lovely link there with history. Um, how big are these different things that we're talking about? Dinosaurs can be huge. Pyramids definitely are. So it's thinking, you know, putting the math to that and seeing the reality. We can see pictures in a book, but actually going out and seeing that scale on the ground means so much more as we're learning. Now, this is a really interesting one that uh, maybe you haven't thought of. This is all to do with music and sound. How is sound created? Um, looking at the, the wavelengths and the frequencies of, of sound and how that changes. So this activity is actually recording that sound as a, um, an, as a slow mo and then repeating it as the slow motion, slowing it down. So we're extending the wavelength and bringing the pitch of the sound down. And if you do that and you can do it easily on your phone, um, it sounds like a building being uh, destroyed it, but it sounds like a building blowing up when you um, reduce, slow that sound down. And then it, 
the creativity of using those sounds in musical composition, but understanding how those sounds are made and making them uh, come alive. So real quite deep science in that too. And um, I love doing a bit of art. I have to say this is me. Um, this is me on the top of one of my favourite hills on a sunny morning, but just enjoying the light and the shadows and creating wonderful kind of artistic interpretations of my my feelings up there and uh, my joy of being out in, in, the, in the light. But understanding how light and shadow works and how that that shadow is formed and you can do lots of different things. Um, we sit in our office and we have a an award in our office which is lovely and it's a prism and every day that it's sunny this light goes through and we see wonderful uh, rainbows in our our grounds and that in sorry in our in our office and that is again just different ways of understanding light and I'll show an image a little bit like that in a minute so those are just a flavor of of thinking about how do we think about teaching about stem subjects but not just keeping them to to stem so that's just kind of a little bit of inspiration so I'm just going to talk about a few ways of, of teaching STEM outside through STEM subjects. And one of the things I would say is, is not being afraid to use technology. Um, sometimes we think, oh, we're going outside, it's all about nature and it's all about, and we mustn't touch technology. But it can be really useful as well for recording data um, and um, uploading information. So we're doing a project at the moment, National Education Nature Park in England, where we're mapping school grounds and the habitats in school grounds. But we're using the technology to do that. So it can be a very useful tool. So, you know, don't think you can't take technology outside. But what do we mean by technology? Um, you know, is a wheel technology, is this fire pit technology, is a pencil technology. So how do we think about technology and and how we might use that outside? This is a very simple kind of way of cooking some lovely apples for our tea. But, you know, lots of different ways of thinking, right, what, it, what do we really mean by technology? How has that developed over the years, as well as maybe thinking about the cooking of, of the food there as well? Here we go. Here is um, a rainbow created outside. As I say, you can create rainbows with prisms and things inside, but how much more fun to go out and kind of spray the water towards the sunlight and, and getting this wonderful rainbow outside. So that's just a, a lovely, very simple activity to do on a sunny day. This one I really like. This is one of my favourite activities of the moment. I go through phases where I have different favourite activities, but this is a maths activity. So this is something you can't really do inside because you would just be worried that you were going to get water everywhere. So what it is, is you measuring, um, calculating the volume of, um, of different straight sided uh, containers and then seeing if we've got the maths right by filling them up with water or, or emptying the water out and measuring the water and making sure you got your calculations right. It's a different way of checking your calculations. And this one is um, calculating pi. So I did this, with these are some teachers who teach um, A level, so top level uh, maths and they were going to use this to try and encourage students to do maths A level. And uh, this is them calculating pi. You cannot do this inside because the, the amount of error you will get with small circles will mean that pi will not be accurate. But outside, you can create large circles, find out what the radius is, measure around the circumference, and then work backwards and calculate pi. And then you suddenly realize, oh, that's what pi is at. Then you do another circle, and you get basically the same answer. And obviously, the more you do, the more accurate you will get. Um, also thinking about science and taking climate education outside, and it's not just about biodiversity, that's important, but it's also thinking about heat and cold, so the changes in weather. It's thinking about can we look at carbon management outside and not just inside our building. It's about flooding, it's about drought, it's about air quality. Um, it's also about thinking where we get our resources from. So lots of science um, that really demonstrates climate change where it takes place. Um, and part of that is about taking temperature around your school grounds um, and seeing what surfaces, the temperature of different surfaces. And you will find a huge difference between measuring the surface temperature on natural materials and man-made materials. And you can start to see why some of those things are adding to the problems of climate change as well. 
Now, I will believe I believe you're going to get these slides afterwards, so I'm not going to go through this in great detail, but this is just a few ideas of, of different ways of taking uh, curriculum led learning outdoors. So just to inspire, but I'm not going to go through it now uh, because you'll see it later. But what I am going to do is just talk about through some of the practical bits about taking um, learning outdoors, because it's all very well me saying, yes, just go and teach outside. But if you're not used to that, if you're just used to kind of um, the four walls of a classroom, that can be quite a, a scary thing. You think your pupils just might run riot. And the first thing to say is if you never go outside and it's a one off, then they may get overexcited because it's an interesting and fun thing to do. But if this becomes part of what you do all the time, then they will realise this is proper learning we're doing outside. And you could start with small, you know, 10 minutes first time you go, 15 minutes the next time, a bit longer if you want to, or just 10 minutes all the time. So don't think it's got to be all day outside or anything like that. Start small. Give yourself confidence as well. So the first thing I would say is you need a place to, to meet just to gather the class together. And this can be a really useful space. It can be a temporary space like these straw bales. In uh, in the UK, we would tend to put tarpaulins over the top because these will get damp and they will rot over, you know, break down over the year. Doesn't matter, put them somewhere else next year, create a new space. But you may also want to create a, a more permanent space. Um, this is a school in Canada that have created a, an amazing kind of teaching space uh, where lots of pupils can sit together. It may be that you just occasionally want to sit in different spaces and you just want some temporary uh, shelter up there as well. So this is a really nice way or it could be a way of just testing where you want to put a more permanent space in the future. And a permanent space might be like this. Now, this is also a kind of passageway through. So um, I love this. This is in Berlin, um, but a lovely space to gather a group. And ideally, you want lots of different spaces, some for large groups, some for smaller groups. Depends on the size of the children that you're working with as well. Make sure it's suitable for the different children. But if you've got a space like this and you've got a short period of time, a lesson time, why not meet? have your lesson outdoors straight after break or straight before break. So you either meet them at that gathering space or you finish off at that gathering space. So you've only got one journey inside and outside each turn, and that can work really well. Storage is really important. If you can keep stuff outside that you're going to use all the time outside, it's also useful to have a kind of grab bag that you take with you when you go out that might have things like clipboards or pencils. Pencils are better than pens because pencils you can still use when it, it's a little bit damp. Um, so think about that. And you can see here, this is a multifunctional space. There's actually a kind of group of seat, seats around this space. So the class starts here. They have stuff on the board. They're all their storage is there. So everything's all in one space and it's got multifunctions. And then the other thing to say is ensure that your staff um, get the training and support. Now, that could be just shadowing another teacher. It could be maybe talking to um, the PE department, physical education department, because they're used to taking classes outside and getting some tips and tricks from them. Um, as I say, you don't have to go tons outside all in one go. Take it gently at a time. Have a signal to call your class back. Check that that works and that they understand it. Clipboards, all you really need, clipboards, pencils and the right clothing, really. That can be one of the limiting factors uh, to going outside. So if you've got, you know, some spare Wellington boots that you have a storage of or when people have grown out and things like that, that can really help too. So I have, um, so that's kind of summary of what I've done. If you've got any questions, do put them in the chat and I'm sure we'll, we'll come back to them later. Thank you. Many thanks, Mary, for this very inspiring presentation. I'm sure that there will be uh, questions later. Uh, already in the chat, uh, we got uh, uh, a lot of people saying uh, how useful and, and, and uh, how convenient are these examples. So I would like to pass the floor now to Richard. Uh, we look forward to hearing from our second speaker. OK. Thank you. Um, welcome. It's always uh, nice to go second to hear what, what uh, Mary's been saying. So <clears throat> I'm going to take a slightly different approach, but that's good. So you'll get a bit of a, a compliment. We're coming at this from perhaps two different angles. So uh, that might be good or it might be, well, we'll find out. So I'm kind of starting with what might be a, an odd question, which is, is it really about going outside? 
Um, and I'll come back to that question. But I kind of like this quote from John Muir, which is, I only went out for a walk and finally concluded to stay out till sundown. For going out, I found was really going in. So to me, we're going outside, not just to learn about what's out there, but we're learning about what's inside ourselves. What are our values, attitudes, what matters to us? How do we relate to everything out there? So in a way, it's not just learning about what's out there <clears throat> as some sort of interesting field of exploration, is how does that relate to me, to my values and my life and what's important? So I think that's kind of a, in terms of the purpose of going outside, we need to think about that as well as the kind of studying of the natural world. So the outdoor classroom, you know, there, there's lots of reasons for going outside. And I'm just going to whiz through a few slides that if you ever need to justify going outside to your senior management team at school, then you can use these slides and all these points to, to kind of sell why going outside. And there's lots of very good research now about why going outside the classroom has learning attainment benefits, behavioural attainment benefits, all sorts of things that your senior management team in a school will want to know about. So, you know, first of going outside, it brings concepts to life. It's real world learning. It, it's kind of direct experience. And those are kind of memorable experiences that, 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 that young people remember. Obviously, it's good for kind of teaching science, life processes, adaptations, food chains, all the kind of ecology, biology things and rocks and physics, the geography about places and processes, environmental change, things we can see firsthand rather than looking at them through a PowerPoint presentation. And of course, history, going out and looking how things have changed over time, how places change and develop um, and, and seeing that firsthand rather than again through kind of history books. It, it, it's a great place for developing skills. You're using kind of hands on experience of inquiry, setting problems, learning how to challenge and find solutions to challenges, as Mary was talking about. You've got to work with the data you're collecting. Again, as Mary was talking about, if you're looking at data on species use or macroinvertebrates in streams or whatever it might be. So kind of know you, it's a very good place for developing all these skills. You've got to use them firsthand. I know there's kind of managing self skills that kind of using literacy to to kind of explain what's going on, to write and to describe what you're looking at, to express that in different forms of writing, not just through scientific writing, but through poetry, through um, creative writing, using the maths, interpreting the data you're getting. Um, <clears throat> art and design, I'll come back to because nature can be a source of design and engineering thinking, and I'll come back to that. Um, music, as Mary's already, already talked about, again, you know, using ICT, using that outdoor data. So don't be afraid of using technology to enhance the outdoor learning experience rather than replace the outdoor learning experience. So definitely enhancing it, not, not replacing it. <clears throat> and citizenship. So, you know, there's a huge benefit for going outside. I used to work for outdoor learning centres and just the confidence that young people get by going outside and surviving. You know, for many people, it's the first time they've been away on their own, alone in a residential field centre, discovering new abilities in themselves, new talents that they didn't think they had, being able to work as a team, look after themselves and each other, all these kind of really valuable life skills that schools <clears throat> are often required to teach, but are really well taught going outside in these what might be a quite foreign, strange environment where they really have to kind of stand up and be counted for. <clears throat> so my question kind of is you know, a slightly cheeky one, but is this all enough? You know, what is our purpose in taking people outside? Is it just to learn about how nature works or is it more than that? So for me, it, it, you know, it's more about creating a different habit of mind. So learning about nature is necessary. So learning how nature functions, how it, how it works together is really important. But it's not, to me, it's not sufficient. Now, we need to learn from nature and indeed we need to learn as nature because you know many of those issues and environmental challenges that Mary talked about briefly they come from this idea that we are separate from nature that we can do things and and live in ways and, and you know that what we do to nature doesn't matter and we forget often that we are part of nature we are as nature and we rely completely upon nature for our survival so one of the big messages for me in, in kind of going outside which, which, in whichever subject area is, am I helping people to see Nate themselves as a part of a natural system, not separate from it, and see, see ourselves as 
intricately linked within that web of life. And this matters because you know, this is an old quote from the Director General of the UN, basically saying all the things that we're doing to help prevent some of the environmental catastrophes happening to humanity, people aren't working. We're not doing things well enough or fast enough. So it really matters that we do this and we change the way we, we look at the natural world. <clears throat> and this is quite an old quote from a book years ago now, but basically saying that you know modern environmentalism hasn't really dealt with the world's serious ecological crises. So either we're not doing enough of it or we need to do it somewhat differently. So those might be quite controversial quotes, but I kind of find it quite inspiring because in a way they they prompt a question to me which is oh should be on this slide oh there we go so <clears throat> what can we really learn from nature that to help humans survive and flourish as one part within planet earth so what i want to share with you is, is very um quickly is three projects that we've been doing across europe which have been trying to answer this question so how can we provide education in a way which kind of demonstrates how we're part of, of, of the planet, how we're part of nature and how we can learn from nature and change our ways of thinking about nature. And I picked these projects also because there's a whole bunch of learning resources on all the websites which you can pick from and use and they're all freely available and I think there's about eight or nine different languages represented. There's a huge range of learning resources you can take away and play with which have been tried and tested in schools. <clears throat> So the first is the Real World Learning Network, and this was a, a network of, of six European partners looking at how can outdoor learning education programmes be important for behavioural change towards sustainability. So we were trying to look at, um, oh, my camera's not working, but I'll keep going and see if I can fix it whilst I'm, whilst I'm talking. Oh, we'll see. Anyway, um, <clears throat> oh, there we go. Um, so yeah, to me, outdoor learning wasn't just about learning about the natural world. It's also about thinking about our behaviours and how we respond to the natural world. So we created this kind of model where we looked at different elements that we felt through research mattered to the learning experience to enable students to rethink their relationship with the natural world. So science was there, obviously, but it was holistic science. It was looking at the, the cycles, the chains, the flow, in nature, so how science works as a system, not as the peak parts. Yeah, so it's the patterns and processes, not the individual parts. So often science is taught about the parts, not how they all link together. And in nature, everything links into a cycle. You can't do one thing without affecting something else. It's also about the experience. So when we're taking pupils outside, are we getting learners in touch with that outdoor setting? Are we provoking curiosity? Are we increasing their sensitivity to the site? Are we learning with the head, heart and the hands, which is that very classic outdoor learning model? Um, are we using a variety of methods? Are we remaining open to the outcome? You know, a lot of classroom based learning has fixed outcomes as to the learning we're trying to deliver. But can we hold those outcomes more loosely and allow the learners to explore outcomes which have meaning and authenticity for themselves? <clears throat> Is our learning enabling uh, learners to be empowered to shape the future? You know, are, are we enabling them to learn cooperatively, to take responsibility for what's taking place in their learning, to deal with their feelings and the feelings of others? Can, can they articulate how they feel about the natural world? Can they be more reflective and critical thinkers? So all these skills, are, in a way, are the skills that are required if we're going to reshape our relationship with the natural world. And does our learning transfer from the outdoors back into or part of the student's everyday life? Or is it just another experience in, as part of the school day? Great, fun, enjoyed it, but it was that was it. Or does that experience transfer back into how they see their everyday lives? If not, then are we getting the most out of the opportunity? And the final one is values. Are we promoting values in our learning which are beyond the kind of self-centered values which are often around the marketing and advertising in the kind of consumerist world and are we create are we promoting values which are more about a respect and care for nature and others in harmony 
and then is there a good story, a kind of a, a connecting story to all our learning so that students can see there's a kind of a bigger message behind what we're doing. <clears throat> so there's a huge amount of research online. So if you're really into thinking about the elements of outdoor learning, which are really going to create more effective programs in terms of behavioural change, there's a, lo a lot you can access online. So you can de delve into that as much as you like. And there's some planning tools to help you kind of um, kind of assess your, your learning and say, well, how can I improve it based on some of these elements? <clears throat> so a second project to talk about is the is a, is a project of urban science. And um, this was looking at how science helps create more healthy and sustainable cities. So the key here was to kind of put science in the context where pupils live. So it's not abstract. So the knowledge, the inquiry, the application was all based on everything that people can find in their in their everyday urban environment, on their walks to and from school, in the school grounds. <clears throat> and the idea here is we, you know, we're kind of moving from what we might see as a kind of a typical um, exercise book example where you know in math you have to calculate the area of a quadrilateral angle and so you know you, you're told to calculate the base by the height and you get a get the area now a lot of books will kind of contextualize that by giving it a, a real situation you know giving a scenario but basically you're just doing the same thing whereas going outside into real world learning you've got the opportunity to kind of situate that learning in a, in, in, a, in a kind of a time frame which, where that, that mass becomes critical. This is an example from the Italian school where they were looking to repaint one of, the, one of the science laboratory walls and the class took on that challenge. So actually calculating the size of the wall became a critical to actually working out how much paint they needed, how much it was going to cost, and also then going to the school board and asking for the budget to do it. So it wasn't just about calculating the area of a rectangle. In real life learning, it comes about many more than that and working together, doing it together, finding the budget, working out the task, actually doing it. So that that hot, that bit of math becomes critical to the actual learning that's taking place. And that, that authenticity is really critical. Again, another project from our colleagues in Italy, <clears throat> it starts with pupils thinking about, well, why is the air quality in Monza so poor? This is a this is a, 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 a kind of a question that came up from pupils, and they wanted to find that out. So they started looking at scientific newspapers and articles. They started looking at the characteristics of the air quality challenge. So what is the issues in our particular environment? Let's go out and explore where the pollution is coming from. What might be the causes? What might be the interrelationships between the traffic and, and the management of the traffic and the height of the buildings or whatever it might be? And then go and explore the data and finding out the data and, and talking to people on the streets and is this issue affecting many many people other, other than themselves and taking that into some form of action so again the learning for me in outdoors goes in sort in, into some sort of action some sort of thing that the learner can take on and and take some sort of um effect and impact on that <clears throat> and there's loads of these resources online so again you can dip into these but they all have this fairly kind of pupil focus. So it's the pupils creating questions that they then go and explore. So it's real inquiry based science education or working scientifically, as we might call it in the UK. <clears throat> and we did a bit of research on both these real world learning and the urban science project. And in a sense, you know, the critical point in this real world outdoor learning is we're not pretending. It's not a make believe scenario that's come from a textbook. This is real concrete experience where the contents and the subjects matter to the students at that precise moment in time. So they really see that they're doing a task which is real and it's not it's not a make-believe activity out of a school textbook. And the real world learning and outdoors really provides that opportunity and also it gives you the kind of the complexity to really see how sustainability is a very interrelated um, discipline where we need to see things and how they interact in that kind of social, historical, physical space. <clears throat> the other thing that I think to come out of that is that this requires you know, an intention that goes beyond just creating a setting where content can be better visualised. It requires from a teaching perspective the intention of giving the pupils um, authority and the authenticity to express their desires and follow their desires for learning and kind of weave curriculum outputs into that rather than start with the curriculum 
and then you know see where you can give students a bit of freedom. And it's in that kind of concrete first-hand experience that adds tangible value to the students' engagement. And this is what kind of starts to construct knowledge which is meaningful for the learner. They kind of start shaping their own values and responses to the world around them. <clears throat> so the last thing I was going to talk about is biomimicry. This comes back to design, engineering, technology. So biomimicry is an innovation method. It's learning from nature to build a thriving, sustainable, human-built world. It's learning from nature as a means and applying that learning to create better and more sustainable human products and services. There's a huge amount of research and, and education going on around this topic at the moment. So I, I, don't, I don't want to go into too much, but there's plenty of resources I can point you towards. But interestingly, biomimicry, critically about, in biomimicry, it's about actually reconnecting with the natural world. It's observing nature and seeing, well, how does nature do things and what could we learn from that? What could we learn from the owl and how it glides silently and apply that to wind turbines so they are less noisy and they don't, don't create a noise that disturbs people? And that's being done. And that's taking something, observing the natural world and applying that to an engineering solution, to a challenge that people face and live near wind turbines. Who's emulating how nature does things and it's doing it in a way which creates a better more sustainable world so the ethics are then coming the ethics are really important it's not about taking something from nature to produce a product for consumption which creates waste the ethics and, and intentionality are really important <clears throat> and i kind of like this quote that you know nature is full of solutions looking for problems to solve nature's been doing this for 3.8 billion years humans nah we're not even out of nursery school yet we're probably not even in nursery school. But just to kind of <clears throat> put it in a slightly different context, if you take a kind of a traditional lesson on variation and classification, which you'll find in most schools, and students might start by identifying the difference between living and non-living things. Now they look at movement, respiration, sensitivity, growth, re reproduction, extrition, nutrition, which we have the acronym in the UK, Mrs Green, and traditionally, you know, they would move on to looking at the how different species vary and how the variations are inherited and how they're caused by environmental factors. They might then use a dichotomous key to sort organisms to different groups depending on their, their, their kind of certain structures or behaviours. And it's a very kind of traditional kind of lesson. But we can kind of change that, you know, we can bring it a different focus. We could bring engineering into a biology lesson by kind of slightly starting to slant it and think about in a biomimicry approach, we can do all that. But when we're using those dichotomous keys and looking at trees, we can also start asking, well, how is that tree providing strength? How is that tree harnessing energy? How is it converting solar energy to chemical energy? How is it transporting liquids and fluids? How is it communicating? So we can start asking these questions. And kind of what characteristics give the tree strength? What characteristics provide energy? What characteristics enable it to communicate with other species? And through that, we can start to start thinking, well, trees provide strength by, by, by adding mass to certain structures, by using curves rather than right angles. So you can start seeing how we can learn from trees to build human structures which are, are stronger because of the way they dissipate stress and forces rather than trying to build things which are just kind of more solid. And this has been applied in aircraft. So you ever fly in a plane, you look at the windows with the cutout corners, they're mimicking how trees and nature deals with stress by using curves, not right angles. So a direct application from nature, which keeps you safe every time you get in a plane. <clears throat> Simple thing like sycamore seeds. <clears throat> Simply throwing sycamore seeds in the air, seeing how they fly, seeing how they move in the, in, in, in the air. This is an activity we'll do with 12, 13, 14 year olds. And they say, well, well, why does the seed have these features? Why is it heavy at one end and lighter at the other? Why is it designed this way? Really observing closely about this, the structure of, of the seed, um, the, the fine details. You know, what, what's the function? What's the purpose of the seed? And why does it have that design? Can you describe the movement? And how might that be useful? And then looking at a challenge in the real world. So in the UK, this is Totnes in Devon. Flooding is a really big challenge and we're getting more of it as the climate changes. So again, looking at the sycamore seeds, well, how could the shape and movement of the sycamore seed be a, be, be a way of thinking about addressing the challenge of flooding? 
And students come up with all sorts of ideas like and with the Archimedes screws, a classic uh, example based on that kind of um, that kind of turning motion, but also little uh, ways of of of, of uh, sending water in different directions, controlling water flow, creating energy when they need it in flooded areas. So just looking at something like a sycamore seed and observing how it moves and observing it closely can lead to thinking about how that could be applied to human challenges. And it delivers across the curriculum as well. It, delivers all sorts of things in biology around ecosystems, interaction, the dependencies, and it brings in design, technology and engineering. So biology and design and engineering going together, not often seen. That's a very, very quick whiz through a whole bunch of different projects out there, all of which are freely available and you can get all the links when, when you get the um, PowerPoint shared together. But really, it's, for me, it's about that authenticity of the student experience. It's about the learner having agency over their learning and learning in situations which are critical to something of meaning to the learner. And I'll leave it there and hand it back over to Miriam and any questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Richard, uh, for your presentation. Very interesting. Also, a great twist uh, from what Mary uh, was explaining before. So uh, I think that was a wonderful, uh, really, webinar uh, from both of you. And now is your moment. Uh, if you are interested in asking to our speakers, please uh, write your question in the chat and we will be answering them. We still have around 15 minutes left. So uh, we will be start. We will be starting by addressing some of the questions from the chat and also uh, questions that we already receive uh, in the course. So I will start perhaps with a couple that are uh, from the course. Um, so how can outdoor learning learning experiences be extended beyond? a single session to provide deeper learning and sustained engagement. Because I think maybe you were mentioning also before that for some teachers, this might be the very first time that they are going. They are taking little steps. They might be doing uh, single lessons here, there. How can they uh, engage and, and make a longer um, I, lesson I, or project? Yeah, I think one of those answers is in the same way that they would indoors. So it's thinking about how you build upon what you're doing outdoors. I mean, one of the questions we ask is instead of saying, why shall we take a lesson outside? It's why are we teaching it inside instead of why, you know, so you're you're almost taking your thinking the other way around. The other thing you can do, obviously, is you can you can think about a project. And one of the things I didn't talk about is how you might um, develop and, and respond within you. Um, through your grounds themselves. So, for example, on climate change, you might be looking at the issues of climate change and thinking, right, we need to think about carbon sequestration. We need to think about cooling our school grounds down and then turning that into, OK, how do we do that? Right. We start by looking at the temperature in different places in our school grounds. Then we might think, out, right, what are the different solutions that we could come out? We could think about moving the air. We could think about creating shade and then we go on to develop the next bit. So it depends on the subject. But as I say, in the same way that you would think about what you're doing inside, think about, you know, just looking at what are we wanting to learn? What's the progression of our learning? And then think, all right, how can we develop that outdoors? And it's not about going right. Every one of our lessons needs to be outside. It's about thinking out where's the right times, where are the best times to go out and take that learning outdoors so that it, as as Richard said, kind of relates to what the rest of, of what you're doing and and um, puts it into context, I suppose. So, yeah, just the same way as you would inside, really, is the, the real answer, I suppose, that I would say. Richard, what's your take on this? Um, I was answering a question in the chat. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I develop a lot of project based learning. It was about you know, helping st students start with a question or questions of interest to them and work out how they're going to investigate that. And as Mary says, some of that might be in the classroom. Some of that might be going out and collecting the data or making observations, et cetera, et cetera. But it's kind of like it, it, it's weaving the outdoor learning into what you're doing rather than seeing it as a, as a special event. If outdoor learning is a special event that you only do on Earth Day, then it can, you, you'll get a little hit and then, then, then you lose it. So in fact, it seems fantastic, but outdoor learning should be kind of part of what you do on, on a regular basis. So you're doing your project-based learning, 
pupils know what's coming up and they know they might be going outside and, and they're ready for that or they're you're setting them homework to do on the way to and from school if they're doing observation of, of, of traffic counts or lichen on trees and, and, and pollution surveys. So you kind of weave it into what's going on rather than seeing it as being a one off. You might start as a one off to build your confidence and competence to doing it. But as, as you go forward, you'll see you'll see more and more connections of how you might teach a bit of maths and you can go outside and teach that rather than just do it inside. Absolutely. And you both in, in your presentations, you gave many, many practical examples on how to uh, engage outdoor learning with range of subjects with different curriculums. Um, but we had a question of uh, in the chat in the course that says, is every STEM activity suitable for outdoor work? And what are the characteristics that we should be looking for in an activity uh, when thinking about outdoor learning? Richard, I'll let you go first this time. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. <clears throat> well, every activity should be delivered in the best environment for that activity. So not every activity, you know, um, I don't know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't do titration outside on a wet, windy day. Because it's you know, clearly not, not going to work very well. But for me, it's, it's, about, it's about, and I use this word real world learning. So it's about relating learning to the real world of the students. So it's directly applicable. And some of that might be looking at, at the latest um, financial predictions from the from, from the from the chancellor in the budget and working out what that means. And that, that would be appropriate to do that in the classroom. But if it's something around engineering and you want to work out how, how to keep buildings cool on hot days, then you might have to go out and look at your building and see where the, the areas are, are, are going to get hot, do, do some measurements of temperatures. And then go and explore well, what sort of animals live in our environment which seem to be very good at staying cool and how do they do that well can we work out their strategies for keeping cool how do they do it? Is it by burrowing is it by being somehow more reflective um, is it through some sort of insulation process so how do how do animals stay cool when they're outside in hot weather and you might do some internet research on that as well you might find species in the in the Sahara desert which do that really effectively like the Saharan silver ant so you might um, complement your outdoor exploration also with some online research. Then you could put that together and start kind of maybe testing out some ideas and hypotheses on kind of super reflective or super emissive materials and take those outside and put them on different parts of school and measure temperatures. So you know you, you, you're doing the learning in the place which is appropriate for the for the um, authenticity of the task and to find the kind of the best location for that learning at any one point in time. So I don't think it's not it's an in or an out question. To me, it's about ensuring that learning is connected to the real world situation of the student, and that could be in all sorts of different environments. And I, I, I totally agree with that. And I think the other thing I would add is there are some things that may not be specifically related to the environment in a way, but the outside space is the best place to do them. Like when we were, I was talking about the water activity we also do a thing where we fire catapults you're not doing that inside but the doing things on a large scale and measuring data and then bringing that data in as a way of collecting data is a brilliant thing to do outside but you can't do it inside so that as richard said the, you know the best reason is is for the context of their learning but there are other things that are just done because you can be noisier and you can be bigger and those kind of things that make the outdoors a great place for doing some things as well i think one, one other point is outside can also be a place where you can be quiet where you can be alone and actually really sense how it feels to be within the natural environment and that can be a, you know even though you're effectively doing nothing that can be a very profound experience as well and i i also remember that that makes reminds me of um, one group that we uh, were teaching secondary school uh, students and we had them working in a lot of different spaces in small groups around and the girls were going, I have to say this was girls against boys. That's just the situation. They were going, this is great because we can get on with our work because the boys aren't disturbing us because they were far enough away. Whereas in the classroom, they were absolutely there all the time making all the noise. Now, obviously, it's not always that way around, but that was that example. <laughs> great. Thanks a lot for sharing your views on this. Um, another question that we had was, can outdoor learning be inclusive and accessible to students from diverse backgrounds and abilities? Is this Absolutely. something that you have encountered uh, based in your experience? 
No, absolutely. And it is looking at that difference between access and inclusivity as well. Um, and part of it is um, just thinking about not just doing an activity where somebody, for example, if you've got um, a child with mobility issues, they're not just sitting on the side and watching what's going on and maybe making an account of what's going on. But it's just really thinking about what all your pupils can do and the positive elements that they can bring to any task rather than what they can't do. Yes, you need to consider that in the practical sense, but what can they do and making um, and yeah, it is just as any other activity, looking at differentiation, looking at how you plan different aspects, how you um, put your your work together in lots of different ways. And a lot of children with special needs in particular, I'm talking special needs now, we can talk about diversity in a minute, but um, really engage well with the outdoor environment that that quiet and that peacefulness and that natural environment can be really good for mental health and well-being but also for a, a great range of of abilities and disabilities outside and 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 those with um neurodivergence and stuff like that that natural environment can be great as well there are some as well who will might be on the autistic spectrum who love kind of just collecting data and that can be something you can do outside. So it's just finding the right activities for your students. It's knowing your students and then um, developing in that way. I mean, interesting about the cultural diversity um, aspect of it and people from different heritage. Absolutely. We do a, a lot of projects where in the UK, obviously, we have very diverse communities within urban areas in particular. And we're looking at how what is happens, particularly with climate change, what happens in the UK as to how that impacts on the home nations of, of different people students in those groups but there's absolutely or you can celebrate the indigenous populations in certain areas and looking at the indigenous knowledge that they bring um, in the uk we've lost a lot of that um, but also building on that is a really good way of of bringing that um that heritage into into outdoor projects as well and through the arts and all those kind of things as well celebrating diversity there, there, there's not very much I can add to that very comprehensive answer. Um, I mean, I used to work for a large outdoor education provider in the UK, and anybody, more or less anybody could do anything. It's just about planning. It, 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 there, there wasn't really a limitation in, in, in anybody's ability. But I do remember there was a particular project working with um, targeting schools in the inner city of London, and the kids who came and, you know, never been outside of London never really seen farms or, or animals in the in the flesh so for them it was, a, it was a very alienating experience kind of kind of young 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 adults who if i went to where they lived i would probably feel quite scared because i don't know the rules of the game but when they came to the natural environment where i was quite comfortable they didn't know the rules of the game so it was kind of just appreciating that people from a different background a different, a different kind of upbringing they, they just don't know the rules. I mean, like with anywhere you go, you just need to know the rules and how things work. And then people start to fit in. So that kind of um, bringing in kind of diverse backgrounds of inclusivity was, it's more about kind of seeing it from their perspective and, and kind of working from that point forward rather than, you know, the assumptions that I would have about going to the natural world, which are very different to other people's assumptions. This is very insightful. Thanks a lot, Mary. Thanks a lot, Richard. I I might try to squeeze in one more questions. We might not be able to, to answer them all because the chat is quite active and we also got many questions uh, in the course. So I will go back to the chat and one of the questions was, um, I wonder ways of taking profit of that outside factor nature while teaching learning language to adults, apart from the liter literacy examples that were already shared today. It's we're looking not, at more like a younger adults or even adults when we're teaching language. Any examples come to mind? <laughs> um, it's I mean, not an area I know much about, I must admit. So, Richard, I don't know if you know more. <clears throat> uh, we've done a little bit of a uh, content language integrated learning. But I mean, in terms of I mean, teaching language in terms of creative writing or, or what areas? So, I mean, in terms, in terms of something like creative writing, just being able to express feelings, emotions and and write on behalf of the animals rather than yourself or putting you know yourself in 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 you know you know describing what it's like for being a yew tree that's been there for a thousand years and and how history how the history it's seen by being rooted to that one spot 
So I mean, there must be lots of opportunities in terms of creative writing and using nature as a, a source of kind of developing your sensitivity. So often I think there's um there's kind of developing a language of being able to express your sensitivity within the natural world, which people don't have. And there's also language about talking about computer games or online environments, but the language of expressing how you feel within nature is often something they, you know, you've got to kind of kind of reach in for that language. It's not automatically there. So there must be something around developing people's emotional ability to use language to describe feelings and emotions rather than just descri describing physical attributes. I was just thinking, uh, no, I was just thinking about the derivation of, of scientific language as well mm -hmm. and how you might relate that to understanding different language. I mean, I, I did Latin at school and I hated it and I didn't do it very long. I gave it up at the first opportunity, but these days I, I use a bit of Latin because I use it for plant names. I use it for animal names and things like that. And then understanding how not only how um, language has been developed in scientific ways, but why have certain plants got you know <laughs> traditional names and things like that? Why is um, why or animals as well? So in Hampshire, where I live, the traditional name for a bumblebee is Dumbledore. And everybody's heard of Dumbledore. So, you know, that can be something that as well, the derivation of words and, and where they've come from and, and that the, um, yeah, the traditional, the heritage as well, from that sense as well, maybe that's something as well that can be brought in. Learning language of adults, but I mean, I imagine if, if you're teaching different tenses, you could just apply it to nat natural topics. But to me, there's, there's kind of like using the outdoors to learn a language. And there's using the outdoor to actually have an effective impact on the learner. And they're two slightly different things. So mm -hmm. using using nature to, to, to learn different verb con conjugations is one thing. But then using that to describe how you feel about your, your experience in the natural world, that's more about that's more about the benefit of going outside. One, one's very utilitarian, the other's actually looking at getting people to think about what nature means to them and how they feel part of the natural world. And that to me is the important element of any outdoor learning. Mm, and related to these emotions, Mary, you also mentioned, for example, about trees and poetry. I yes. think poetry, perhaps, it's uh, a very nice way of combining yeah. both because a subject and what Richard is. Yeah, I mean, one very simple activity we do with young children, but it would be for anybody learning a language, is we ask them to pick up a leaf and, and list all the adjectives that they can. And then in a group, they bring all their adjectives together. And then we have several groups. And you go around the group and each turn they have to say an adjective related to the, to the leaves and you go around until you've run out and, and whoever's still got adjectives is the winner. But at the end of it, you've got a word bank full of really wonderful descriptive words that you wouldn't have got if you'd been inside and said, think of adjectives related to a leaf. So if you're mm. outside, you, you know, you've got the touch, you've got the smell, you've got things breaking down, different shapes, all sorts of things. And you just wouldn't get that if you were using this, doing the same activity inside and just said, right, think of adjectives describing a leaf. And then use those adjectives to start writing a, something about those leaves and make them into sentences. Absolutely. Or doing kind of poetry where you all write a line each and then you get a, a really weird poem which emerges, which you'd have never written on your own. <laughs> the collaboration aspect again there's a really big thing about how collaboration seems to be undersold you know competition seems to be the way to move forward whereas, whereas actually collaboration is the way we move forward as a society and outdoor learning is really about that collaborative effort which is standing on the shoulders of others rather than competing with each other I couldn't agree more and I note down this uh, sentence uh, Richard from your presentation that nature is full of solutions looking for uh, problems to solve, uh, which exactly. I, I love. And I think it summarized uh, really well. Uh, well, uh, one of the learnings that we got today and uh, as time is running now, I would like to thank everyone uh, that joined us. As mentioned earlier, you will have access to the recording of the webinar, also to the slides and all the links that the speakers share in the course. We also look forward to see you on Tuesday, the 26th of March in our Teach Meet, which will be the last live event of this course. You will find more information in the live section. And I would like to say, to say thank you very much, uh, Mary, Richard. This was a very, very uh, inspiring session. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And thank you all for joining us. Uh, see you in the next one. Bye bye.